I'm so glad you're here. If you want uh, to tweet me during this uh, for questions and whatnot, you may certainly do that. At I can't tweet back because I'll be talking, uh, but later I will tweet you back and it'll be wonderful. Uh, so my name is Jessica Hilt, and I'm going to be talking about strategic storytelling. I always like to say it again because once I got stuck in a physics class that I thought was a literature class, um, and I was too embarrassed to leave. So I just want you to be in the right area. Please don't leave. All right. So who is this woman? Um, that's a good question. And what gives me the authority to talk about strategic storytelling? So I'm going to tell you a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, in 2010, I graduated from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. Uh, I had a literature degree, but I had worked in tech for 10 years. And I decided that um, I wanted to quit Aristotle International and, uh, and do some writing. And then I got super lonely, because writing is super lonely. So I joined a nonprofit called So Say We All. And So Say We All works very hard to bring voices to the performance storytelling stage. So veterans, Native Americans, people with disabilities, women, but also um, we also put on like a show in a bar and we just tell really great funny stories about, you know, peeing yourself one day uh, and how embarrassing that was. It's, it's a lot of fun, uh, but I joined it and I, I told my first story on stage and that was in 2010 and then I just kept talking and talking and talking until finally uh, they had recruited me to teach storytelling. So now I teach how to generate a story. I also teach how to refine that story for the stage. Um, I teach how to bring uh, emotional truth to a story. I do all this for a bunch of different groups and I really, really love it. But what I found that was very interesting is that in the meantime, over this course of five years of continually telling stories, I I went back to work and I worked at the University of California San Diego and I realized that the people who can tell the best stories not, not the people with the facts, but the people who could tell the best stories got their ideas adopted a lot faster than other people. And so I wanted to make sure that that kind of ability could be accessible to more uh, than people like me who just happen to be a, a really good writer and good at my craft, and so I know how to tell a story. So I want to talk about how you guys can use, you guys and ladies and women and queers, and all the other people uh, can learn what storytelling is. So what is storytelling? Uh, when we talk about storytelling, most of the time uh, we brainstorm about it. The first thing we talk about is like cavemen sitting around a fire and talking about stories. Uh, and then if we brainstorm a little bit more, you might get like fairy tales and folk tales and books. But most of the time when we talk about storytelling, we're talking, we, we tend to think of it as fiction. And if we're like a really great geeky group that listens to, you know, National Public Radio, we might eventually get to nonfiction storytelling, which is like Radiolab, the best podcast ever. Uh, and it makes me cry every time. But it's usually in those later steps that we get to the nonfiction side of things. And then if you're like a super, super nerdy um, person who maybe dabbled in literature or you remember middle school, uh, you may have remember this Freytag's Pyramid, which talks about there's a story as exposition, and then it's rising action, and there's a climax, and then there's falling action, and then there's resolution. So why storytelling? Now, when I talk to uh, a group of geeks, this is what I usually get. Data, facts, science, that is all I need to make my point. And you know what? I totally disagree with you. And I have data, facts, and science to back me up on that. So storytelling uh, the act of storytelling activates parts of the brain that facts and science do not activate. And when we activate those parts of the brain, really, really interesting things happen. So one of my favorite things is there's this great study about oxytocin in the brain. And the, bra the parts of the brain that are activated when you tell a story produces oxytocin. When oxytocin is produced in the brain, you are 80% more generous to a stranger. That's not like a little amount, that's like a big amount. So if a stranger asks you for money after a story, you are more likely to give them money, 80% more likely to give them money. Uh, 
And the other thing that is really interesting is that the listener of a story in their brain uses that story as their own experience. If it's a really good story, you live that experience too. It's why we cry at movies. It's why we get scared during horror. It's because it activates a part of a brain that makes it our own experience. 65% of our conversations are personal stories and narratives. I think that needs to translate into business as well. So one more thing, evolutionary. I should have been an evolutionary biologist because this stuff is my favorite part. So stories convey information. We know that from evolution. That's how stories were helped with evolution. The best food was over here, right? And that was told in a story. Uh, the worst place to go in the world is over here, and that was told in a story. Never do this, that was told in a story. Um, stories help us bond. When we tell stories, people tend to bond with us, and that's how we created human communities. There's also a really great study that talks about the increased uh, neurocognitive organization. What that means is that we can think more complexly because of the stories that we build, and that's why there is a theory. That is why we do so much better than other animals is because we have these stories and we can build these complex neural networks. And then my favorite one is there's simulated dilemmas with no risk. So Evolutionarily, if you were like, hey, I totally want to climb Everest, and then like somebody climbed it and they died, and the next person was like, hey, I totally want to climb Everest, and then they climbed it and they died, we would not, you know, that would, that would be a really bad way to live. Uh, stories allow us to see somebody's uh, fight for life and learn from it and then say, okay, don't climb Everest. Bad idea. Just saying, bad idea. All right, because I work for a university, my favorite thing in the world are these really um, simple ideas like storytelling, and then academia gets a hold of them, and they turn to things like neuroscience and the new urgency of emotional appeals. <laughs> like, that's the best title. Of, it's really about storytelling. But sure. So here's, here's the, a good quote from um, that, that book. A dispassionate brain that reasons through issues, a brain that weighs evidence, follows chains of reasoning, pursues its best interests, is a brain that apparently does not and never have, has existed. So that's hilarious. We think that brain should exist. We think that everybody should judge something by the data and facts alone, but that is not how it works. So I'm going to give you a, a real application of how this worked, how storytelling worked in a business or medical scenario. So in uh, the University of Massachusetts, I'm in Massachusetts, my first time in Massachusetts, University of Massachusetts Medical School study, the problem was uncontrolled hypertension. So what they decided to do is they had a, a study group of people that had uncontrolled hypertension. They were constantly having to be given medication. Um, and what their hypothesis was, was what if we set up this group where their peers are telling stories of how they got their hypertension under control. People within their own group who succeeded in this, how they got their hypertension under control, and what happens if we had them tell their own story. So they did, and it was uh, the result was amazing. They got a 10-point a, a drop in blood pressure. That's millimeters per mercury. I had to look it up. You can laugh at me. It's totally OK. Um, so that's what that did is that there's this whole drug industry that uh, now has lost money, which is a good thing, because we got some uh, we got a different way to control that hypertension, and it was through the process of storytelling that that worked. So okay, fine, Jessica, but wasn't your talk about strategic storytelling? Yes, it was. So the first, the, the what the strategic storytelling does is it create it. It, it is the creation of the creative side of the storytelling with the business side of the storytelling, and that's strategic storytelling. So what is strategic storytelling? Now, if you happen to be in marketing or really love it, you may have heard strategic storytelling before. What we usually hear it is when we hear it uh, with commercials. So if somebody's trying to sell you something, they might talk about strategic storytelling. Uh, mission statements and marketing tend to also be strategic storytelling. And then Kickstarter actually uses it as part of, like if you do a Kickstarter, you have to tell the personal story of why you want this Kickstarter to happen in order to even put your Kickstarter online. So that tends to be examples of, of strategic storytelling. But I also don't want you to forget some of the other aspects of strategic storytelling, like founder stories. If you've ever heard a story 
this company was built in a garage. That is a founder's story, right? That's a story to a, an emotional appeal of how that company existed and why you want to be interested in that company. Impact stories, client impact stories, your employees' impact stories, and your personal story are all also strategic storytelling. So here's some data on why strategic storytelling is really important. So three to one, if you have customers, consumers bought products that provoked an emotional response three to one. I am definitely this person. There's a dog, you love your dog, don't you love your dog? Buy this dog food, I have to buy that dog food, right? Like that's, that's the emotional appeal that, that hooks me as a consumer. And then storytelling also has a universal appeal. If you have a diverse workforce or you have a diverse audience, storytelling crosses those diversity uh, lines. Uh, storytelling can be used to bring in people that you have not reached before with other forms of marketing or with your, with your own work mission statements. Uh, there's a strong link between a strong uh, strategic story and staff productivity. So if your company is really, really good at communicating why they do what they do, you are more likely to work harder for that company. And I think that's true. If anybody's worked for a company that has done a really good job of explaining why they do what they do, you're like, oh yeah, I totally understand why I work and what I do and that makes me feel good. I work at a university they do not pay us as much as the private sector. But for me, it's working for the greater good. And if my university is really, really good at telling me why I work for the greater good, I am less likely to move into the private sector. It's just the case. Now, here's the scary part. Surveyed, 80% 80, 80 of 450 organizations said that employees did not understand their strategic direction. Well, duh, have you ever read a mission statement? They're terrible. They, all these buzzwords, all this wonderful stuff that you have absolutely no idea. You, the bottom line is you have no idea what you're working for. So if you're, you don't understand your company's strategic direction, you are unlikely to work as hard. That's a huge problem. Strong link productivity, 80% of people don't understand. Huge problem. So, um, I like to point this out. We know that people are substantially more motivated by their organization's transcendent purpose, how it improves lives, rather than its transactional purpose, how it sells goods. If your mission statement is all about selling goods or your boss, when he's talking about a project or she's talking about a project and she says, you know, this is, we're doing A to do B and B is just a product or a transaction, you're less likely to be motivated by B. However, if we talk about why this project is important for the greater good of the company, the greater good for the mission statement, the greater good for our clients, then we're more likely to work harder. So because I don't want to get caught up in mission statements, because Snoresville, um, I want to tell you a little bit of story about what strategic storytelling can do on a personal level. So I was in an interview for the job at the University of California, San Diego. I had been working in data for a while and working uh, at Complete Campaigns and Politics. And I managed a bi-coastal support uh, center where um, you know I had worked for like eight years. I was really, really good at my job and I was you know technical enough, uh, but they were looking for somebody to work directly with their developers, with their sysad commun sysadmin community on campus. And I knew that eventually they were gonna get to this point where they wondered if I was technical enough to walk among you. <laughs> and I was pretty sure I was technical enough, but I had to convince them I was technical enough. So it was a scary interview in a tiny, tiny room with as many people as they could cram in. There was like seven people around this surfboard-like table and I was on the end. Uh, and the woman who would eventually be my boss said, um, how do you keep abreast of the latest technological advances in uh, this sector? And I was like, okay, well, this is the question. Like, I nail it, nail it. Um, and so what I said was, well, I only date geeks. <laughs> and then I explained that when you date, you have to be completely versed in what the other people are interested in. Um, you have to be versed in what they do and what they love. But uh, you can't ever bullshit it. 
right? Like they see right through that. You can't ever be like, yeah, like the cloud is amazing and I love it and I do all sorts of stuff in it. Like that would never, ever, ever work. Uh, and so you have to be versed enough and you have to be honest enough when you're talking to people that they know exactly what you know and they know you're interested, but they also know you're not an expert at it. Nailed it. Totes got the job. All right, so hopefully at this, report, at this point you're like, okay, I'm totally on board. Strategic storytelling sounds very interesting. I should probably use it. Tell me how, how do I do a strategic story? All right. So first, there are three components to telling a strategic story. The truth, the audience, and the narrative. We're going to talk about the truth first. So the, if you've ever heard a story from someone, um, especially in management, uh, higher up in the company, the story might go, everything is the best, we are awesome, this new project's awesome, go team. So there's a problem with a Pollyanna story. Pollyanna stories also are something that you can see right through. Nobody wants a Pollyanna story. Nobody is like, yeah, yeah, that's worked before. We've never had projects fail. We're always awesome. Everything is the best. Let's go back to our desk. Work hard, right? Nobody's like that. So what you have to remember is that it's got to be the good, the bad, and the ugly. You got to talk about how great this is going to be, but you also got to talk about how bad it's going to be, right? Remember when we did this before and it totes failed? Yeah, talk about that. Um, we also have to talk about the ugly. Um, is this going to be hard? Is this going to be a tax on our resources? Are people going to be working overtime? These are all the things that have to come up in uh, the conversation about your strategic story, whatever it is. So a good example of this, and you may remember this, um, Apple did mobile me, remember that? That was so bad, <laughs> super, super bad. And then iCloud came out and everybody was like, did Apple forget about mobile me? Because that was a disaster. And when Steve Jobs did the keynote about iCloud, he said about mobile me, it was not our finest hour. And that did two things. The audience laughed, right? Uh, it gave us a little break because everybody in the audience was like, mobile me, mobile me. And he's recognizing like, oh yeah, mobile me. Totally big failure, sorry about that. Uh, and then the other thing it did is it, it gained credibility. Um, because he recognized that it was a failure, whatever he had to say afterwards, we knew was probably gonna be the truth, or at least we thought it was gonna be the truth. And then I'm gonna tell my own story. So I worked for CompleteCampaigns.com. This was our clip art. I always said I was the blonde at the end. Because people, nobody ever saw me in person. Uh, so CompleteCampaigns.com, we, uh, we did data for political campaigns. We um, culminated that data into something called an FEC report, which is super sexy. You'd love it. Uh, and we send that to the Federal Election Commission. And those records become uh, public, publicly available to anybody that wants to go and access them. Uh, and if you donated over $99, your name would be on this report. So complete campaigns, we screwed up. We had a giant bug the day before a filing. All these reports were filed with, a, um, with really big problems on the F FEC report. Now, <clears throat> the really terrible thing about FEC is that they keep those reports forever. So those mistakes live in perpetuity. So if you make a mistake and then you amend a report, it just like shows up next to it, you know, doesn't replace it. Uh, and my boss came to me, Ben, who was amazing, and Ben said, okay, customer person, uh, what are we gonna do? What are we, what are we gonna do? We filed all these reports and they're incorrect. What are we gonna tell our clients? We had a choice, we could lie. <laughs> you totally screwed up this report. Would you like your, some help refiling that? <sighs> We could tell the truth. We could go say, hey, guess what? We made a huge mistake. And we did. We sent an email and we called our clients and we said, we made a huge mistake. This is the mistake we made. This is what we're going to do in the future to correct it. Can I help you file a new report? And the outpouring of the emotion from our clients was amazing. People were very happy that we told the truth. Uh, one of my clients said, what I know is that when you call me and you say it was my fault, I will believe you um, because you told me it was your fault first. And I think that's super important. So if you've ever seen me speak to before, I love to quote myself because I'm amazing. I should be quoted. 
Uh, my, my quote for this would be, embrace your failures, they make great stories. Uh, at So Say We All, I am constantly helping people get on stage to tell their stories. Usually those stories are huge failures in their life and become great stories uh, of success on stage. So just remember, embrace your failures, they make great stories. So the next thing I wanna talk about is um, the audience. So when you're telling a story, you have to know your audience. And I know you hear that time and time again, uh, because that's really something nice and cliche to say. But I want to talk a little bit about what it means to know your audience, and especially in something called push versus pull strategy. So push strategy is like a movie, right? It is when you sit down and you watch something, and that information is being fed to you, right? You're, the story is being told to you. Um, a pull strategy is much more like a role-playing game. Everybody's involved, everybody has a role to play. There is, you know, a game master, a GM, a DM, um, and they are running the show, but everybody has their own input. So let me give you an example. The problem that the Canadian Board of Tourism had was Canadians don't think Canada is exotic enough. I feel like that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good problem. So the objective was to get Canadians planning trips to travel at home and not abroad. So they started a campaign called hashtag where is this? And what they did is they just showed these phenomenally beautiful pictures with Canada hashtag where is this? And I don't know about you and I understand I'm an American that lives in California but I did not think Canada looked like this. I know, I should travel more. So what happened was kind of phenomenal. They started using this hashtag, where is this? And people knew where places were because they traveled there themselves. And so they would reply with where the location was. But then other people who had been to a different exotic area of Canada would take their own pictures and send it under the hashtag, where is this? And it became insanely popular. So all these Canadians were talking about like, oh, you think that's beautiful? Look at this, look at this. Uh, hashtag, where is this? And then they were telling their own stories about their own uh, family trips there. So they were getting, the, the Canadian Tourism Board was getting interaction with the, the brand they were, people were reading the hashtag and, and interested in it, but then the company saved all this money because people were putting their own pictures online and, and tagging them and sending them out into social media, and people were telling their own stories. So what was the result? A half a billion dollars more was spent in Canada than it had been before in, in travel. I think that's pretty, I mean, billion, that's a lot of money. So when you're considering this for your own strategic story, whether that be a project or whether that be um, going into an interview or whether that be a mission statement, the things that you want to consider are all, the, are, are all the stories top down. Is this story only coming from the project manager? Is it only coming from the CIO or the CEO? Is it only coming from management? Where are the other stories coming from? Where are the stories that involve the staff, involve the clients, involve people who have a smaller role in the project? Are we just talking about who we are, not just what we do? You need to talk about who the company is. It can't just be, we're doing this project because we gotta do this project because Bob said so. It, it can't be that. Nobody's inspired by that. Why is the project important? And lastly, for the love, you are not an Aesop's fable. Uh, if I go to another meeting where um, the moral of the story is told to me, uh, I will probably scream. Uh, you don't need to tell people that what they're doing is important. They need to come to that conclusion. If they're not coming to that conclusion, the story isn't being told correctly. So let people come to that conclusion. If you tell people, you're just telling them, and they're just going to think you're just some bozo telling them the moral of the story. Aesop's fables were terrible. All right, finally, let's get to the narrative. So if we remember Freytag's period, pyramid from middle school, just kidding. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, I always want to bring up, uh, when we talk about Freytag's pyramid, uh, I am a huge fan of Dead Poet Society. I loved that movie. 
It was such a great movie. Did somebody clap? I hope somebody clapped. Um, so there's this really great part where he's explaining like how to graph to see if a poem is important, right? It's amazing, amazing thing. Um, and I think about that a lot when I see Freytag's Pyramid because what people love to say to me is that like stories or or are organic. So if you're telling me how to write a story, it's not organic. It's not going to sound organic. It's not going to come organically. And if I believed that. Um, I would not be a writer because writing is very hard work and it's a craft and you have to get better and better at it. And that doesn't happen organically. That happens with practice and that happens by uh, seeing how to create a, a strategic story, how to create a Freytag's pyramid. So there are a few elements. These are like the pyramid, right? You set the stage. There's this dramatic conflict. I know you've had a project with dramatic conflict and then there's a resolution, right? All right, so what is setting the stage? What is rising action? All right, so when you're talking about rising action, you need to talk about what's in the past, what's changing, what are the external, chain, uh, external pressures that are making that change, and what is the challenge? So I'm gonna give you an example from my own work, despite the fact that the, the people who are involved in this will eventually be able to see this. It'll ruin all my secrets. Um, so I work in technical outreach and uh, program development for UCSD. And one of the things that I work about work with is uh, bringing communities together. And in particular, um, we're a research university. We do a ton of research. And we have what uh, we have labeled as research developers. Research developers are usually developers who do some research or researchers who learned how to code. But in general, researchers live in very siloed areas, right? They work for Scripps, uh, Department of Oceanography, and they work in an office that's way, way far away from anybody else, and they don't get to talk to other people who code, um, or they do a particular type of research that, that's kind of rare. So we have identified these people as kind of being people who want to pool resources but have no idea how to do that yet. So I was um, given the job to go out and um, they wanted a repository of information. Uh, we call it a tech wiki. Uh, we already have one for our system administrators. It was very highly adopted. People love it. They put information in it. They use it as a resource all the time. We wanted to do something very similar with our research developers. So I went out there, and my job was to set up the, uh, it's a Confluence installation. Uh, we have Confluence. It's super beautiful. Um, it was Wikimedia before. That was not beautiful. Um, it's fine. It was good in 1995. Um, and we set up this beautiful thing, and it was basically empty, because I'm not a research developer. I can't pour that content in there. So the challenge was to go out to these communities and say, like, please, please put your content in there. So what I told them is I told the story of how it's worked in the past. Look, you've been working in this great area. You're doing all this amazing research. You have all this knowledge. You have knowledge like, how, what's the best way to get salt water out of a hard drive? Like you have knowledge that nobody else has, but sometimes somebody else wants that knowledge. So we would like you to put this into a repository. Uh, I tell them about the external pressures. Look, resources are really scarce. Um, we're going into an era where they're probably gonna become scarcer as grants become scarce. So we would like you to put this information in so that you can share resources. So if you know Jane has this and Bob buys this and they're both buying the exact same product and then you only use it half the time instead if you only bought one and then could share it, right? External pressures. And then what's the challenge? Okay. I want to create a place that everybody can come and put this information. They can put it as a code repository, an information repository, an experiment repository. So then there's the dramatic conflict. I know, dun, dun, dun. What is the unknown territory? Well, you have to be able to talk to them about the things they're scared about. Uh, researchers in general are afraid of a whole bunch of different things, like their research being stolen. Well, I don't want to do a co code repository. If I put my code up there, this other lab's going to steal it. Okay. Well, let's talk about a little. Let's talk about a couple of different things that we could do. Um, don't put the code that you are afraid to that would be stolen. That is propri proprietary. Terry, but maybe put other code out there? Or how could we set up the security so that only the people that you want to see the code can see it? 
Um, the what ifs. What if I spend all this time putting in this and nobody uses it? I will tell you that's my number one fear. I hate to waste my time. I'm amazing. My time is valuable. Um, so that is a big what if. What if uh, we spend all this time building up Confluence and nobody uses it? And then um, what is the change? This is the change. And the change is we talk about Confluence, we talk about the security models. And then resolution. So if you are the king of the north, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you know that, that Jon Snow never said he was king of the north. We all know Sansa should be. Uh, but everybody started calling him king of the north. So the big piece of advice is don't tell people you're the king of the north. Wait for them to say that you're king of the north. Don't tell them that your solution is the end all be all. We want them to come to that conclusion themselves. You need to provide the information. You need to show them that you think this is the, uh, the, the solution. Uh, and then you need to let them come to that conclusion. Now, that's not to say that you should be um, totally locked into your solution. You have to, this is all about change. You have to be movable. You have to listen to their ideas and come up and say, okay, that solution isn't perfect. Let's think of other things that could be perfect. We have to tell them why, what happens if this works. You have to show them the good side of things. If this works, you get to share resources. If this works, we come, become a better company. If this works, our security is actually going to be secure instead of a big fake security. Um, why do they have to take the risk and why failure is an option? Um, and it's okay and it's a risk. I tell, when I talk to the research developers, I say like, this may not work. We may find out that we pour all this information in and people are terrible about keeping it up to date. Um, and then we might have to re-examine a, a different sort of solution. And then how, the, how this aligns with the bigger picture. You always should bring it back to the larger world, whatever that company is. Um, is, this, is this helping your mission? Is this helping this project? How is this project helping the bigger mission of the company. Um, you also can't tell them it's going to be easy. You can't be like, yeah, and it's going to be easy. If anybody's watched a sports ball movie, there's a moment when the coach is in there and they're like, is it going to be easy? And they're like, no, are we going to do it? Yeah. You can't tell them it's going to be easy because the first time it's not easy, they're going to come back and say to you, you said it was going to be easy. And then you're locked into that. Finally, remember this? This absolutely has a place in strategic storytelling. Um, it's still valid, it's still important, it's still part of the story. It is, you have to use data because if you don't have data, then you don't actually have a solution. So you just have to make sure that that is part of the creative part of it and is also part of the data part of it. All right, so guess what? I really hate Q&A, <laughs> but we have time for it. So uh, I know I speak ridiculously fast, so if you do have questions, I will take them. However, be nice to me, um, or I will come down and be mean to you, too. I can't do that, I would never be mean, you know I won't. Does anybody have a question? <laughs> yes. Please come to the microphone. We will talk microphone to microphone. I think I would just add one other thing. Aside from strategic storytelling, um, storytelling has another purpose too. So where I work, we actually do story slams, but we're not allowed to talk about work. So they're all uh, personal stories, things like that, and it does a really good job, um, uh, you know, increasing that personal touch between uh, team members and even non-team members. So. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's part of that human bond. Um, I think people work better together when there's a human element. Despite uh, the um, claim that geeks are super antisocial, uh, I think we actually are pretty social. I know I'm an anomaly, but go ahead. Um, part of storytelling is how you tell the story and the kind of embellishments and things that you add to uh, 
your, your vocal uh, vocals when you talk. Mm -hmm. um, how would, would you incorporate th that, and how would you get better at it? Um, so I'll talk about the get better at it part first. Uh, the get better at it part first is that you practice it. Um, I'm very comfortable talking, but that's because I do it all the time. Um, I tell stories all the time. I tell them on stage. I'm not nervous in front of people, but that's because I practice at it. I certainly started out nervous. Um, if you're, if you were like me and you were really nervous speaking in front of a group, the the first thing I would recommend that you do is um, visualization, is picturing your audience, and when you practice a talk, it would get my heart rate up. Like I would like get physically nervous just doing a visualization because I was thinking about it. Um, but that's the best way that you can do it. As far as vocal inflection. Um, I think the thing that people don't realize is that when you're, well, I don't know, some people do realize this, um, actors and anybody who gets on the stage, I think they feel like they're going over the top um, when they first start out, but it just becomes part of how you tell a story. So yeah, I think practice it, you know, be goofy. I'm a terrible, by the way, terrible actress, worst actress you've ever seen in the world. Um, but I think vocal inflections are one of those things that y you just practice at it. And you sound ridiculous when you first start doing it, but you just got to get over it. <laughs> Suppose a story has already been told that paints a very, very happy and unrealistic picture, and people have bought into it. How do you come behind that? What could you possibly mean? Yeah. How do you come behind that and tell a more realistic story? Um, I guess it depends on your goal. Um, if your goal is to undermine, which sometimes it is, sometimes it is, um, it is about, uh, for me, it's about a delicate balance between understanding what parts were the truth of the original Pollyanna story, because there are, I mean, that's how people buy Pollyanna stories, is there are parts of truth. So recognizing the parts of truth, yes, we do have to make a change. Yes, that change is something that we have to do right now. No, the change that being that is being suggested is a terrible idea. Um, and then just making sure that that story is um, believable and not crazy over the top. The story that you're telling also has to have the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like we need to, there's a, there's a product that we have at work that everybody is unhappy with. Um, for a long time, the story that was told was, that's okay, it's too hard to make that change, we just have to live with this really crappy product. Um, and eventually, the story that was being told, which was, hey, actually, it would be really hard to make this change, we totally recognize it, it would take over five years, but it's essential that we make that change. And eventually, the story that that was being told um, became enough of the, the baseline that people bought into it uh, over the other story. And I think that happens. Like, we have products. Um, I mean, Fro Fox Pro still exists. And we have products that people are still saying, well, we can't get rid of it because we have way too much invested in it. That's a story. I mean, what's the realistic story? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? What is it? Does that answer your question? Yeah? OK. I have a quick one for you. Um, so I don't know if you've had any experience uh, telling stories to people from distinctly other cultures and whether you've had stories fall flat on their face because they just didn't work in that context. Uh, or, you know, is there anything at all you can share around this? Because you've clearly spoken to many, many different types of audiences. Um, I will say, I think, yes, there, do I ever fall flat? All the time. Um, I will say probably the biggest time that I fall flat with um, a diversity of, of an audience is when I try to use humor or, um, and my humor is dry and um, sometimes a little too snarky. So that, that sometimes falls flat. Um, and I would say that, um, Sometimes when I think that my story has fallen and that nobody gets it, it's because people get it and got it really, really deeply and need some time to process it. And so, I, you know, uh, I, we tell a lot of stories that so say we all that are these heart-wrenching stories of domestic violence um, and, or abuse. And we've, I've, I taught a class with a group of teachers where I talked about my own story with my, with my parents and it, I was silence in the 
exam room. And I was like, well, that didn't go well. And it's a terrible story. Like, I hate telling the story. It's, a, it's like emotional for me. Uh, and I felt that nobody in the, in the room got it. Um, but then I, much later, I had people who came up to me and said, like, your story gave me the freedom to explore my story. And so don't always think that your story falls flat because it's not giving you the, I think it's more about the reaction than it is about the story. I think stories in general are universal. Humor is not, but I think stories in general are universal, so just give it time. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. I am a job seeker, mm. and I did appreciate what you told a story during an interview, but how do you translate some of the storytelling to a cover letter which is written where you do not know your audience and you have zero feedback as to whether or not the story was well received? That's an excellent question. Um, I love cover letters, uh, mostly, um, I had, I worked for a company once that threw away all the cover letters. It was so, so weird. They just looked at the resume, which is fine. That's what they want to do. Um, when I was a, uh, when I was a manager that hired, I required cover letters, mostly so that I made sure everybody read the job description where it said cover letters were required. Um, but what you want to do when you're writing a cover letter is make sure you're not explaining your resume. They have your resume. They don't need any more explanation on your resume. What you need to talk about is the job that you're applying for and how your personality, whatever you do extracurricular that might not be on your resume, um, is, a, is a good fit for that job and why you're a good fit for that job. Um, I think my, I'm trying to think about my own cover letter and what I have in it. Um, and I think what I talk about a lot is because my job at, it, as its very best, is nerd herding, um, and at, at its very worst, which is not bad because I love my job, is being an advocate. Um, and so I talk about that because that's not something that you, you know, advocate and nerd herding usually aren't dots in your in your resume. So I talk about that as part of a part of my skill set. Does that answer your question? Sort of, yeah? Yes. Okay. All right. No more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.